Hey everybody, we're about to get started here in just a couple of minutes. We're still getting a couple few things set up, but uh, appreciate you guys joining us uh, via live stream. And those of you who are here, thanks for being here. Um, look forward to worshiping together. <clears throat>
Hey, Sister Peggy. Great to see you. started here. Um, thanks everybody for being here. It's our first time back in the space in a little while and uh, appreciate all you guys coming together, um, caring for one another, loving each other. Uh, got at least one or two new people with us. Thank you for being here. God bless you and uh, thank you for joining us. Um, it's definitely a special moment. We've been meeting in little smaller groups and uh, it's a special moment to be able to be back in the space. Um, all of you, of course, who are not yet able to be with us, you are here with us in spirit, and we are praying for you and we love you as well. Um, we thank you for joining in via the live stream. Um, we want to start just by thanking God for answer prayers and continuing to pray for those who have been ill. You should have received a worship guide. If you did not receive that, uh, feel free to um, uh, reach out to me afterwards, and I'll get you the email. Uh, I'll send that email over to you, but um, just want to make mention of a couple of things. One is uh, Latoya messaged us this week and told us to take her off the prayer list because she's got a lot of answer prayers regarding her tests and stuff. So we thank God um, for all the answer prayers there. All of her health concerns have been uh, alleviated um, by the grace of God. We thank God for that. Um, we want to continue to pray for the DeGrosa family, um, both... Laurel and Alicia have had some um, ongoing pains that just continue to plague them. Um, also, Cliff, Cliff has some lingering health issues as well uh, that seem to be related to the virus. And so we want to keep them in prayer. Alicia has a lot of tests going on this week. Um, so let's be praying for her and uh, reaching out to her and encouraging her as much as we can. And uh, let's just begin together before we uh, start worship. Let's begin by approaching God in prayer. And, um, and thank you here for the blessings he's given us. Oh God, our Father, we are so grateful. We are so grateful to be together, to worship you, both in body and in spirit, um, with those who are not able to be present. We are so thankful, Lord, that we're able to come and surround your throne and approach you and, and, and worship you and give you the glory and praise you deserve. 
you know how desperately we need this in our lives and you know how, how desperately we long to be back together. And we give you all thanks and all praise for bringing us through the storms and bringing us back together um, uh, to be with each other, to be able to worship uh, you and to be able to build up each other um, in the presence of, of one another. We are so thankful, God, that you have continued to protect us, to provide for us, to uh, be faithful to us through every storm, through every trial, through every tribulation. And we pray today that our worship would honor you. We want to especially ask you to be with those we love who are sick. We want to especially ask you to uh, be with our sister Alicia, who's going through many tests this week. We want to ask you to be also with uh, our, our brother Cliff and our sister Laurel, who continue to have lingering symptoms as well um, from, from the virus. We pray, God, that you will heal them, that you will help them, that you will strengthen, comfort, and establish them. And we pray, God, that you help us to hold them up and to encourage them day by day. Uh, we are so thankful that you have answered our prayers for our sister Latoya, that her uh, tests have come back clear. We are so grateful, God. You have, you have answered so many prayers. You have blessed us so richly, and we thank you for that. And we pray, dear God, that you will continue to hear us, that you will continue to protect us, to provide for us, and most importantly, to guide us closer to you. As we worship you now, Lord, may everything we do be to your glory, to the glory of your name. May we, may we build each other up, but may we most of all exalt you above all else. It's through Jesus we pray. Amen. Good morning, church. Uh, before we sing a couple songs, let's, let's read... Uh, for, for scripture reading, the yeah, opening scripture, opening Bible in Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah 6. So, this is the passage when Isaiah, when God calls Isaiah for his mission as a prophet. And so, this is what happened. And just let's meditate in these words as we see. Um, you see the throne of God and uh, Praise that was the angels singing to God. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1 to, to verse, uh, verse 6. In the year of King, uh, of King Uzziah, Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne. Lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood before him, before him, each having six wings. With the two, he covered his face, and with the two, uh, he covered his feet, and with the two, he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundation of the, the thresholds tremble at the voice of him who calls out while the temple was filling with the smoke. Then I say, woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among the people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the, the seraphims flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with the tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sins is forgiven. This is the God that we serve, the God who forgives sins, and God who cleans us, God who makes us right to sing praise to him. So as we sing today, let's remember what God has done for us, and let's give him glory to this holy name. Amen. Amen. So the first song we're singing, let's sing, We Will Glorify. 
Ah, we will glorify. Let's sing this song, all the verses. We will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of Lords, who is the great I am. Lord Jehovah reigns in majesty. We will bow before his throne. We will worship him in righteousness. We will worship him alone. He is Lord of heaven, Lord of earth. He is Lord of all who live. He is Lord of all the universe. All praise to him. So hallelujah to the King of Kings, hallelujah to the Lamb, hallelujah to the Lord of Lords, who is the great Amen. Amen. The next song we're singing, It Is Well With My Soul. Uh, let's meditate on this song. It is a powerful song. And uh, just, just take a look on the words. And uh, I love a special the verse, uh, the last verse, when it say, my sin, uh, not in part, but all of them um, has been forgiven in the cross of Christ Jesus. So let's sing and meditate on this song. It is well with my song. When peace like a river that my way, when sorrows like sea deal of Praise the Lord, 
images of uh, Isaiah seeing the Lord and then um, the lyrics uh, Christ has regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul I'm not sure why they really hit hit home today um, let us pray Lord thank you so much we come to you completely grateful for everything you've given uh, all of us in this room up to this point for bringing us all together uh, at this time um, and in our lives, bring us together this past year, two years, three years, Lord. Uh, we thank you so much for this church in Brooklyn. Um, we thank you for what we've been able to do, what you've allowed us to do during, during this pandemic, uh, using the internet, Lord, and, and new people we've even been able to get uh, to come to our family uh, to your family, Lord, and uh, we pray, we, we thank you so much for giving us your son, for giving our sins through sacrificing your own son, Lord. Uh, we don't deserve it, Lord. We, uh, we have been uh, sinners. We've sinned against you, and uh, we are so grateful that you've taken away that sin. You've blotted it out and replaced it with light. And uh, we ask that you continue to build us up so that we can go out and gather more souls for this family, for your family, Lord. Uh, in your son's name, our Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Next song we're singing. Uh I keep falling in love with him. Mm -hmm. uh, I love this song because uh, in first it's short and uh, the message is simple. Uh, it goes like, keep falling in love with him. Of course, it's a good thing to sing, just knowing what God has done for us. His amazing grace. Um, he who first loved us, when we were dead, he made us alive. So it makes sense for us to sing, like keep falling in love with him and he keeps changing us. Um, so that's the song we're singing next. I like sing all the verses and I uh, just follow if you don't know the song. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. He gets sweeter and sweeter as the day goes by. Over and long between my Lord and I, I keep falling in love with him. Over and over and over and over again. I keep falling in love with him. Over and over and over and over again, I keep falling in love with him. Over and over and over and over again, he gets sweeter and sweeter as the day goes by. Over and long between my Lord and I. I keep falling in love with him over and over and 
The next song we're singing is the hope that is waiting for us one day that we will be with the Lord. Even though we go through suffering and a lot of pains in this life, in this earthly life, we have a hope that one day we will live with him. And he have a promise. He's faithful. He will fulfill it. So that's a song we're singing next to soon. And very soon we will be with the Lord. Amen. Um, so this is a song we've been singing, and just follow um, uh, those who already know the song. It's an easy one, so it's easy to sing. You can get the train, and let's move on. Uh, soon and very soon, we are going to see it. Soon and very soon, very soon, we are going to soon and very soon, very soon. We are going, that's what we sing, hallelujah, hallelujah, we are going to sing the king. Soon and very soon, we are going, oh, soon and very soon, very soon, we are going, and soon and very soon, very soon. We are going, that's why we sing, hallelujah, hallelujah, we are going to see the king. One more quiet day, 
we are born oh no more fighting we are gone and no more fighting we are going, oh hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We are going, no more quiet there. We are going, and no more quiet there. We are going, no more quiet there. No more quiet there. We are going, see. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We are going to see my brothers there. We are going and see my brothers there. We are going to see my brothers there. See my brothers there. We are going that's what we sing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, we are going, that's what we sing. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we are going, and see my sister there, my sister there. We are going, and see my sister there, sister there. We are going, oh, see my sister there, my sister there. We are that's what we sing. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We are going. That's what we sing. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We are going. Oh, and see my Savior there. Savior there. We are going. And see my Savior there. Savior there. We are going. And see my Savior there, see my Savior there. We are going to see. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We are going. And hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We are going to see. And soon and very soon, very soon. We are going and soon and very soon and very soon. We are going and soon and very soon and very soon. We are going, that's why we sing hallelujah, hallelujah. We are going, that's why we sing hallelujah, hallelujah. We are going. Oh, hallelujah, 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 we are going to see the King. Man, we call uh, Brother Antonio for the scripture reading. Good morning, church. Today... We're going to be re reading from Ephesians 2, from 11 to 22. Ephesians chapter 2, from 11 to 22. And the word of God reads, Therefore, remember that formerly you who, who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in a body by human hands. Remember that at a time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace. Who, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier that divide the wall of hostility by the setting aside in his flesh the law with his, its commands and regulations. His purpose was to, cre to create in himself one new humanity out of two, thus making peace. And in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross 
by which you put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to, to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on, built on the foundation of apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is drawn together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit, the word of God. Amen. Let us pray. Oh God, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. We thank you, God, for showing us your mercy, even when we did not deserve it. We thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die for us on the cross, because you wanted to have us back. God, we thank you uh, for loving us, even when we did not deserve it, even in our transgression, even when we were sinners. God, we ask you to speak to us, open our hearts, strengthen us as we listen to your servant, Caleb. God, we ask you to join us and build us and bind us in your word. I pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, good morning again, everybody. Such a blessing to be back together. Such a blessing to be able to sing praises to God again together and uh, to be able to worship God and give him the praise that he deserves. Um, to those of you who are not yet with us, we are with you in spirit. Our hearts are together with you. And uh, we praise God. We've come a long way over the past few months. And the Lord has uh, been so, so gracious to us. May we never take moments like this for granted um, what a blessing it is and we give thanks to God uh, for truly his love does endure forever um, I want to ask for maybe an extra measure of grace and grace and patience today um, today we're going to talk about the issue of race and racism and I realize that this is kind of a sensitive spot for uh, for many of us I'm not so foolish as to think that my meager attempt to uh, preach on this subject will do this topic justice. Um, I'm sure I will not say everything that needs to be said today, unless you guys want to stay here all day. Um, and I'm also sure that uh, I, I doubt I'll say everything in the way that it needs to be said either. And so I want to ask for your patience here um, as we discuss this topic together. Um, May we, uh, may we discuss it with care and concern for what the Lord has said in his word about this important thing. Um, you know, this is obviously uh, a topic that is um, really, I guess you could say, like on everyone's mind uh, it, it, in our nation right now. Um, it, 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 is, it is also a topic that is near and dear to the heart of God. Um, it's a topic that's relevant for Christians here. It's a topic that's relevant for Christians abroad. It's a topic that is relevant to our nation right now. And certainly our, our, our nation as a whole is hurting. Um, there are deep divides uh, along many fault lines right now. And we are desperately in need of guidance on how to find peace and harmony in a deeply divided world. We are, as Christians, we are sent by God. We're sent by God into the world to shine light on this issue and on every other issue. Um, to show how God's plan can help us to overcome racism and every other sin that divides the people of our world today. Uh, we're sent by God to show how God's plan can lead us to unity. A unity that transcends race or class or ethnicity or culture. Um, 
and a unity that we so desperately dream of. So I pray today that, I, that we'll be able to see what God wants us to see uh, from his scripture and that uh, he'll be glorified by these efforts. Um, I do want to address before we begin, though, one of the questions that I'm sure is on many of your minds right now. Uh, you might be thinking, well, why are you, Caleb, a, a white guy, going to stand up here and talk to us about, uh, about racism? Are, are, are white people, and specifically um, white men, a big part of the problem in our nation right now? Um, and couldn't, couldn't we have got one of the other brothers of color to uh, stand up and, and talk about the subject? People would certainly have more insight into this than I would. And the answer, of course, to that is yes, um, and yet here I am. Uh, so why am I talking about this? Well, one, I want to talk about this with you because God talks a lot about it in his word, and God talks a lot about it in his gospel. So if I'm going to be a preacher of the gospel, then I need to give the same attention to this topic that the Lord does. I need to give the same emphasis that the Lord does uh, to this particular issue. But I'll say this too. I'm also speaking about this because almost every non-white brother or sister that I know has asked me to talk about this. And I've tried to listen to them. And I've tried to listen to their experiences and what they've gone through. Over the years, I've had so many brothers and sisters of color say to me, if people of color are the only people, if brethren of color are the only people preaching and teaching on racism, then we're never going to address this subject uh, uh, in a healthy way. Uh, there's got to be white brothers and sisters who stand up and talk to people about this. And I believe they're right about that. I believe that is true. Um, I'll say this too, as we get started. Um, another reason why I'm speaking about this is because I've made a lot of mistakes in this area over the course of my life and almost every other area. Um, growing up in a place that was overwhelmingly white, um, I've certainly done a lot of things wrong in this area. And I've certainly, in my relatively short history, um, had to learn a lot on this particular subject. Um, and the Lord has brought me a long way over the past uh, 33 years. And because of that, I've tried to learn from my failures, learn from my mistakes in this area, and share some of the things that I've learned from the scriptures, and from the word of God, in hopes of helping each one of us. So uh, let me just say this too. I want to say something about why we need to talk about this right now. You know, some of you are thinking racism. Do we really have to talk about this? I mean, look around. There's like four continents represented in our assembly today. Like, we have a big issue with this. Do we really need to hear about this? And my answer to that is yes, and here's why. Um, racism is one of the biggest stains on the history of people who call themselves Christians in this nation. Um, many people in this nation want nothing to do with Christ. And it's not because of anything that Jesus Christ did. It's because of what uh, it's because of the racist behaviors of alleged Christians over the past 400 years in this nation. And I would suggest that it's our privilege and our responsibility to show the world that only Christ Jesus can actually rescue us from the problem of racism in this nation. The problem of racism and classism and ethnocentrism is almost as old as humankind. Um, there is scripture addressing the subject literally all over the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation. And the Bible makes, makes it clear that it is God's plan to reunite all the nations into one kingdom, into one family, into one chosen race. So racism is, is not a new problem it's not a new struggle. The early church even struggled with it. The apostle Paul spilled a lot of ink trying to address it in his letters and to help the church to stay united across tribe and tongue and nation. And so if our father in heaven cares deeply about this, and we know that it's been a problem throughout our history and throughout the history of the people of God, then we also ought to speak up about this problem so that we do not fall into the same sorts of divides that many Christians and many people in this world have throughout history. Now, I, I do think there's a risk in speaking about this, particularly here in this assembly. Uh, I don't want us to think primarily in carnal terms. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that we regard no one according to the flesh. And I think it's important for us to recognize that what unites us as the body of Christ is far more important than the things that, divide, that Satan is using to divide us. 
And I don't want you to walk away from this thinking that this is really a bigger problem in this church than it really is. It's really remarkable what the Lord has done here among this assembly. It's amazing to me to think about the fact that we have people from all over the nation and all over the world who are gathering together to worship God and to love God and to love his people together um, with one voice to come together and glorify God. That is, that is really a remarkable thing. And I trust that the same spirit who began this good work in us will continue it until he finishes what he has began. But much of our preaching is proactive rather than reactive. You know what I mean by that? What I mean by that is we don't just wait for there to be a huge problem of sin in our camp to address it. We try to address these things before these problems arise to prevent future divides in this area. And especially with the diversity that God has blessed us with in our assembly, um, especially because of that, no matter how sensitive this topic is um, or how well we may think we're doing in it, uh, it's not like there's, not, there's no room for growth. And we need to continue to work on this so that we continue to grow with it. So, so I wanna talk to you today about the sickness um, of racism and uh, the causes of it. And then I wanna talk to you about the cure that the gospel gives for this illness. And then lastly, what is God's prescription for how to address it and how to overcome it in the church? So first, the sickness. Let's talk about what is racism. Um, Racism is the belief that that race is the primary determinant of different traits and capacities. And that racial racial differences produce an inherent superiority of a particular race. Um, I'll add to that that actually in this country, often racism has had a power component to it where uh, people have used privileges and and, um, power to actually oppress and to to take advantage of and to exploit people who were in minority groups throughout our history. Essentially, racism is the belief that one race is superior to to another. And in this nation um, and in most places across the world, there have always been problems with this. and think about this. This is not a new problem. I see it's all over the Bible. It's been a problem all throughout history. And it's a problem all over the world now. Um, it certainly is a problem across New York City. But I've seen it all over the United States. And I've been to Africa and I've seen it in Africa. And I've been to the Caribbean and I've seen it in the Caribbean. And I've been to Latin America and I've seen it in Latin America. I mean, this is a problem everywhere. It's not like it's, not like it's just a white problem or a black problem. This is This is a problem all over. And I'll just say this too. For some people, it's not racism that is their biggest struggle. It's classism. Uh, It has to do with wealth, like um, how much a person owns or or how much a person has. Uh, We think of people people as inferior, not just because of their skin color, but also sometimes because uh, they have less than us or because they're not as popular as us or because they're not as smart as us, so we think. And so I don't want you to think that racism is the only form of of this sin that we're talking about today. It's not the only ism that's ruining the lives of people across this world. But the principles that we discuss here will apply to all of these. And and all of these things inflict pain and division among the people of God and in our world. So let's talk for a moment about what is the root cause of it? What produces racism? Um, And I want to suggest to you that the Bible teaches that the root of racism underneath of it all is pride. At the root of racism is pride. Why do some people believe that they're better than others because of the color of their skin? Why do some people believe that they're better than others because of the tribe that they come from or because of their size of their nose or because of the amount of wealth that they possess? When you boil it all down to size and you get to the root of it, there you will find the problem of pride. We see ourselves as better or more important than others, as better or more important than we really are. And let me just clarify here, because uh, in English, we use the word pride sometimes in a positive sense. Like, I'm proud to be an American. Um, and and I, think there, I think there's nothing wrong with speaking like that. Um, when we say that, we don't mean that Americans are better than every other nation. I, at least I hope that's not what we mean by that. I think the idea is we value and we appreciate the nation that we are a part of. So sometimes we use pride in a positive sense, but it's not that way in the Bible. When, when the Bible speaks about pride, it's, it's always in the negative sense. And, and the emphasis, the, biblically, 
Pride is seeing yourself as more important than you really are. You think of humility in Philippians 2 is considering others more important than yourself. Pride is the opposite of that. It's considering yourself more important than, than you really are. And, and I want you to remember that in the Bible, uh, pride has always been a problem for God's people. Do you remember the story of Israel? Do you remember their struggles with nationalistic pride? Um, Moses, for example, in Numbers chapter 12, was attacked by his own brother and sister for marrying an Ethiopian or a Cushite woman. Um, it's why God is constantly reminding them to care for the foreigners and the aliens among them because their ethnic pride led many of them to consider other nations, other peoples inferior. It's why Boaz was so concerned about Ruth going to another field because he knew that in many parts of Israel, she wouldn't be true, treated like an equal. She wouldn't be cared for and appreciated. And if it's true that pride is the root problem uh, that produces racism, in reality, all of us have contributed to that problem. All of us are guilty. You know, often when this topic comes up, we rush to defend ourselves from the charge of being racist. But I want you to think about this. Perhaps we're not. Uh, perhaps we've never, perhaps some of you have never struggled with any form of racism. But which of us can honestly say that we've never thought of ourselves as more important than another person? Can anybody say that? Can anybody say, I've never, see, I've never considered anybody else or treated anybody else as if they were inferior to me? You see, really, when you think about the root issue here, it cuts us down to size because all of us struggle with pride. Racism is a heart problem. Racism, it's a pride problem. And if we don't address our pride, then we, are, we shouldn't be surprised to find ourselves vulnerable uh, and falling victim to racism or classism or any other sinful egotism uh, that we may uh, stumble into. And if we understand the root of the problem, then we must realize that if we're not attacking pride in our hearts and in our lives, if we're not pursuing humility, then we're giving the devil an opportunity to take root and, and, and produce things in us that will eventually divide us. I think appreciating that if we're Christians, the knowledge that we hold some responsibility for contributing to the spread of this disease of sin and pride and racism in this world ought to move us to and encourage us to work towards finding and sharing the cure. Um, there's a lot of talk right now in our nation this week about finding the cure. Um, but let's talk about what is the cure for racism. And of course, as Christians, we should expect that the scriptures hold the cure for racism. And indeed it does. Uh, but some of you may be wondering, where, did, where in the Bible does it really uh, talk about race? That, does the Bible use that word? Well, actually, that word translated race is used in the Bible uh, a few times, only a few times. The word genos in Greek. Um, and it denotes the idea of family or nation or kind. Um, but while the word race isn't used often um, in Scripture, a careful reading of, reading of Scripture will show that the topic of race and ethnicity, by the way, the word for Gentile comes from the word ethnos or ethnicity, uh, nations, um, that topic comes up all throughout Scripture from cover to cover. I thought about today maybe just taking one story and looking at maybe the story of Ruth or the story of Rahab or the story of Esther or the story of Jonah to, to talk about this. Or maybe thinking about how Jesus treated people of other races or, or, or looking at the early struggles that Christians had with racism. But then when I thought about that, I decided against that because I really want us to see how the whole gospel story, the whole story of the Bible at it, on every page undermines racism. And, and reveals the cure for this terrible sickness. So let me just trace the Bible story with you quickly. I'm going to give you five, five key points in the Bible story, in the gospel story, um, to show how all of Scripture really undermines racism. So the, so the Bible begins with God creating the world. And in Genesis chapter 1 and in verse 26, notice that what God says when he creates man in Genesis 1 and in verse 26, God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man, verse 27, in his own image. And in the image of God, he created them. I want to suggest to you that at creation, mankind was made in the image of God 
and an understanding, an accurate understanding that every human being is made in the image of God is the cure for racism. It undermines every form of racism. Black Lives Matter not because of a hashtag or because of a movement. Black Lives Matter because God said in the beginning that every human was made in his image. Paul says in Acts chapter 17 and verse 26 that all the nations came from one. That is, we are all related as human beings in one race, in one family. The family of Adam, the family that God made in his image. So right at the beginning of the story of the Bible, you see that God has created us all in his image. And I would suggest that many of the problems in our world right now really boil down to a lack of appreciating the fact that other humans are made in the image of God. Uh, but that's not how the Bible story ends. Unfortunately, uh, we get to Genesis chapter 3 and man sins. And after that, really the rest of the Old Testament is the story uh, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3 and verse 23. We are not only all one in our humanity, we are also one in our corruption. We have all sinned. We have all gone astray. And because of this sin, we all died. That's what the scriptures teach. And there's no exalting one against another if we're all dead. There's no, uh, there's no uh, considering myself superior to others if I'm dead. Um, seeing our own sin levels the playing field. And since we have all sinned, we all need to look inward first before looking outward at anyone else. This should produce within us a humility. You might say, well, I'm not as bad as that guy or that brother or that sister. I'm, I haven't treated people like that. Well, can a man that's drowning in three feet of water look down on the man who's drowning in 30 feet of water? They're both drowning, you know. Really, it's not, it's not, it's not even better to drown in three feet of water than in the 30 feet. And the truth is that when it comes to sin, we are all drowning. But for, the, but for the grace of God, we would all be dead in our sins. And so understanding that helps us to realize that fundamentally we are all a part of the problem. The Bible says we are all guilty, thus we are all in need of God's transforming power and grace in our hearts. And admitting our part in the problem is a step toward becoming part of the solution. Since we are sinners, though, we can't solve the problem on our own. And that's why we praise God. Thanks be to God that what we cannot do God did. The passage that our brother Antonio read for us uh, earlier says that at the cross in Ephesians chapter two, says that at the cross, Jesus died to break every barrier down, to reconcile us first to God by dealing with our sin and removing our sin so that we could be reconciled to God. But also he, he emphasizes in Ephesians two, that, that this reconciliation was not just to God, but it was also to each other. That God intended through the death of Jesus to break every barrier down between Jew and Gentile, between black and white, between American and Asian and African and Latino, and to bring all of God's people into one body through Christ Jesus. And so Paul says to the Gentiles in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 12, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from the citizenship in Israel and foreigners the covenant of promise without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made the two groups one, has destroyed the barrier and the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. What was the purpose of all this? Well, he says the purpose of this was to create in himself, was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, one new body, one new people, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile them both to God through the cross. I want you to think about that. What this text is telling us is that the whole reason that Jesus came and died was to reconcile us both to God and to each other. Jesus came to break every barrier down. And, and when he did go to the cross, he provided for us once and for all the cure for racism. He broke every barrier down. He united us into his body. He forgave us our sin. 
He made us part of a kingdom and a priesthood to our God, a multiracial, a multiethnic, a multinational family. And you think about this, even, even the way to becoming God, part of God's family undermines racism. Once you think about this, how do we get right with God today? Well, the Bible answer to that is we get right, we get right with God. We are justified through faith, according to, to Romans chapter 3. Faith is what makes us right with God. And therefore, and therefore, this kingdom is equally accessible to everybody. If faith is what makes us right to God, then there's no privilege for certain groups of people in entering the kingdom of God. Everybody can choose to trust in God and everybody has equal, equally, is equally accessible to the kingdom. The kingdom of God is equally accessible to every person. In Acts 10 verse 34, uh, Peter says, God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. So any ethnic or racial distinctive does not commend you to God. Faith is the only thing that can commend us to God. And faith is, is a desperate plea for God to save us by his grace. The way into the family of God is designed to break down every barrier. And I'll just add this too. Finally, how does the Bible end? The Bible ends with an eternal family of God, an eternal kingdom of God's people that is multi-ethnic, multi-racial. It's a congregation filled with the people of God from every nation, tribe, and tongue. Look with me, if you would, at Revelation chapter 7 and verse 9. And before I read that, let me just say this, that God's plan has always been to unite all the nations and all the races of man created in his image. That was always God's intent. And, and that's what you see on the day of Pentecost when the, Lord, when, the, when, when the Spirit comes down, while there's Jews there from every nation under heaven. Why? Well, because God's plan was always to unite all the nations into his family. You see that even in the Old Testament. Sometimes we forget that when the Israelites came out of Egypt, it was a mixed multitude that came out of Egypt and into the promised land. The book of Exodus tells us. And you see that certainly in the New Testament with the renewed Israel and the church. The church began with Jews from every nation under heaven. And shortly after it began, God used persecution to drive them out and to preach the gospel to all the nations. Um, the Ethiopian eunuch is a good example of that. Uh, somebody who was seeking God from a far off nation. And yet, and yet he came to know the Lord because the spirit drove Philip to him. And so the spirit drove Philip to, to show him the goodness of God. You know, some people today think of Christianity as the white man's religion, which just shows how unfamiliar with history we really are. We forget that the gospel spread to Africa before it ever got to Europe. We forget that many of the earliest Christians in scripture were Africans. Simon of Cyrene, the Cyrenians were the first to preach the gospel in Antioch, the first multi-ethnic church um, in Acts chapter 11. Lucius of Cyrene, Simon who's called Niger, uh, were two of the earliest teachers in that church in Antioch. Um, Apollos was an Alexandrian. All of those are Africans who were part of the people of God. So God intended from the beginning that his church would be multi-ethnic, multi-racial, a multitude that is on earth as it is in heaven. And this is why when Peter started segregating from the Gentiles for fear of the Jews, Paul rebuked him to his face. Why? Because he said it was not walking in step with the gospel. That is everything about the gospel was meant to show Peter that he was supposed to be uniting with all the nations who call on the Lord. And so we're working with God to create an eternal family with people from every nation, tribe, and tongue. But having said all that, I mean, probably most of that's not new to you guys. So, uh, so if the gospel's given us this cure, then why is it such a problem? And, uh, and why are we struggling so much with this? And why are churches struggling so much with this issue? If the gospel's given us a cure, then what do we do about it? How do we become part of the solution? How do we stop the spread of racism across in, in our churches, within the church, and within the nation? Well, here's God's prescription. Uh, and it starts with repentance. And I say this because if, if there may be some of us here that as we're hearing some of this, we're reminded of things that we've done and things that we've said that we need to repent of. And I just want to say to us, if, if, if I'm guilty of the sin of racism, then I need to repent. And it doesn't matter whether I'm white or whether I'm black 
or whether I'm any color in between, if I'm guilty, I need to repent. If I built barriers after Jesus died to break them down, then I need to repent of that and I need to change and I need to go and tear those barriers back down and try to replace them with bridges to the people who I've broken my relationships with. I need to seek forgiveness. I need to repair those relationships and reconcile with my brothers and sisters and my neighbors. And I'll just say this, I've heard so many heartbreaking stories of racism among brethren. And this is not just uh, among, among black brethren, I've heard from Hispanic brethren, I've heard from all sorts of minorities, and I know even from white brethren who have experienced, who experienced racism, there are so many heartbreaking stories. If I've sinned against a brother or sister or a neighbor, then I've sinned against God. And I need to go and I need to repent of it. I can't just act like nothing happened and then just move forward, ignoring what I've done. I need to repent of it. But probably many of you are sitting here and you're saying, okay, well, I'm not sure that I'm guilty of this. So why are you saying this to me? Um, and I just want to say this, you know, we, we live in a culture that's obsessed with individualism, but the Bible knew nothing of that. Um, if you read Daniel 9, Ezra 9, Nehemiah 9, what you'll see in scripture is that there's such a thing as collective responsibility. And you'll find men confessing sins that they themselves did not actually commit. And yet they're confessing on behalf of their people uh, the sins. And they're, they're saying we have sinned against God and we need to repent. And, and, and I say that to say, I don't want anyone to walk out of here feeling guilty about a sin that you did not commit. That is not the intent. And that is not biblical. But there are scriptural examples of people taking responsibility for sins they did not commit and working to try to be part of the solution, working to try to inspire communal repentance. We are not just individuals connected to God. We are part of a community of people, a part of brethren and a nation of God's people. And so while I don't want you to feel guilty about sins you haven't committed, I do think that each of us plays a part in and should feel some sense of responsibility to work towards bridging the gaps and reconciling people first to God, but also to each other. So if you're here and you're thinking, well, what do I do about this? Well, I want to talk about today um, as we wrap up here for a few minutes, I want to talk about what I call the, uh, the arc of rooting out racism. And by the way, the ARC, this, this acronym ARC, A-R-C, is not original with me, um, but I think it's really helpful to help you kind of remember some of these things, um, some of these suggestions that I'll give you from Scripture. Uh, so the A stands for awareness, the R for relationships, and the C for commitment. So I first want to talk about awareness. Um, and what I want to say first about, I'm going to give you three suggestions on this. The, the first one is, we need a greater awareness of what the scriptures teach about race, racism, ethnicity, and how to stay united as the people of God across cultural and racial differences. The scripture has a lot to say about this. Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Ruth, Esther, Matthew, Luke, Acts, Romans, Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians, Revelation. Those are just a few places where you see this come up in scripture. There's so much scripture that relates to this topic. We need to study it. Now, the reason this matters is Jesus prayed in the garden on the night that he died. He prayed that we would be one as he is one. And he wasn't just praying that for his 12 disciples. He wasn't just praying that for white Christians or for black Christians or for Hispanic Christians or for Asian Christians. He wasn't praying that we would all have united, separate, but equal churches. He was praying that all Christians from all the nations would be one. And if it's important enough to Christ that he would be praying about this on his way to the cross, then it should be important enough to me to figure out how with God's help to make this happen across the races and across the cultures in his kingdom, in his church. Another reason we need awareness of what the scriptures teach is that there's so many different perspectives out there about how to solve this problem. There's so many different voices saying, well, this is what we need to do. Well, this is how we're going to overcome this. This is how this is, going to, this is going to happen. And the truth is that many of those voices, not just right now, but all throughout history, have actually, in, in trying to overcome injustice, in trying to, to stop oppression, have actually furthered injustice, have actually furthered oppression. 
Many of the solutions that people are offering actually perpetuate racism and continue oppression. And so really the only person who knows the solution for this is the God who created us. Only God can solve this issue of racism. And if we're going to be part of the solution, then it will only be by knowing what he tells us to do in his word and then submitting to it and letting him teach us how to love one another and how to care for one another and how to build each other up to the glory of God. We need an awareness of what the scriptures teach. We also need an awareness, though, of, of, of the history of race in this country. And I want to suggest specifically we need to think about the history of race in this country in the churches of God. Uh, my great great grandfather, Sir Winston Churchill, well, I shouldn't lie when I'm preaching, right? Yeah. So, uh, um, used to say that those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And I want to suggest here that many of the many of the failures over the course of our history have come from the fact that we have not learned from past mistakes. Remember the book of Deuteronomy? A huge portion of that book is devoted to telling the history of God's faithfulness and man's unfaithfulness. It's basically a, a recitation of their history of sin. And you might be thinking, if you're one of those young people, why does he keep talking about that? Why does he keep telling me about what my parents and my grandparents did? Well, the reason is because God knew that if they did not learn from those past mistakes, that they would repeat them. And that's exactly what happened to the Israelites. Denying or ignoring the sins of the past only makes it more likely that we will continue to perpetuate them. And I want you to think about, are you aware of ways in which churches have defended, covered up racism and white supremacy over the past 400 years in this nation? That's been a huge problem in churches. Um, did you know that Dylan Roof, just five years ago, Dylan Roof, uh, who went into a black church and murdered nine people of color while they were literally sitting down to study the word of God like this. The man who did that was, uh, was, was known to be a Christian, grew up in church, claims to still be a Christian, and has been found drawing pictures of white Jesus in his prison journals. With no remorse, with no repentance, with no attempt to ask forgiveness for anything that he's done. Have you thought about the fact that the whitewashing of Bible characters has had a negative impact, a seriously negative impact on brothers and sisters of color in this nation? That the segregation of churches or the marginalization of, of brothers and sisters of color, uh, not just in this nation, but in the church, has had a huge impact on perpetuating racism and perpetuating this problem. Maybe it's easy for you to dismiss a story like Dylan Ruth. You probably think, well, he would, probably wasn't part of a faithful church anyways. But I've heard far too many stories about racism in many churches that we would consider, most of us would consider to be faithful churches of God to just dismiss this and say that's just part of the past or that's just somebody who's not really a Christian. I'm talking about, I'm not just talking about far off past. I'm talking about recent past and present things that are going on. So we need an awareness of our history so that we don't repeat it. And let me say this, too. We need an awareness of the culture that we're living in right now. And I'll tell you why. We're in a pretty unique cultural moment right now. Many are crying out for justice and for righteousness, but they don't know where or how to find it. Many are longing for, for the world to be right, and they realize there's something within them that wants life to be just and fair for every person, that wants to stop the oppression and wants to stop the marginalization but they have no foundation for it. And we have an opportunity to point people to the God of heaven who can give them a foundation for it, who can show them, who, who can show them how to create a just and fair society, who can show them how to love one another and how to care for one another, and who can motivate them to do it. We have the opportunity to help people and, this will, and, and understanding our culture, being aware of our culture, will enhance our ability to connect, with our, to connect with people and to help them see the need for the gospel. Let me suggest there's biblical precedent for this. Do you remember when Paul went to uh, the city of Athens in Acts chapter 17? The early Christians studied more than just the Bible. When Paul went to the city of Athens, he spent some days there studying the city and studying the culture of the city. And when he spoke in that sermon to the Athenians, 
You notice he didn't quote any scripture, though much of what he said was dependent upon scripture. He didn't quote any scripture. You know what he did quote? He quoted Athenian poets. He spoke about um, uh, the, the idol to an unknown God that he saw in the city. He connected with them so that he might show them who the real God is, who the real king is, who could save them from their sins. So there's biblical precedent for this. And, and of course, the other reason why we need an awareness of the culture we're in is so that we don't become captive to the corruption in it. So many churches throughout history uh, have fallen into the corruption of their culture and lived blissfully unaware of the fact that they were doing. And we're not so strong that we can't fall into the corruption in our culture, too, whether it's in this area or in many other areas of life. One thing that's going to help us with this is humility. We need to be humble enough to consider that my worldview might be coloring my perspective more than I realize. Uh, I heard about a black preacher who was talking to a, a white preacher, and he said, he, he said, the problem with white brethren is, uh, is, is that they think they don't have a culture. And, of course, the white brother um, exposing himself said, well, what are you talking about? To which the black, the black brother said to him, um, well, you know, most, he said, most of the white people I've been around, he said, uh, when, when they do something, they don't think of it as doing it the white way. They think of it as doing it the right way. It's easy to think that way when you're in a majority culture. One of the blessings of being here is most of us, we're all minorities, and we get to experience, hey, not everybody does things the way that I do. And of course, that's not just a white problem. That's a problem for people of every culture. So we need to be intentional about learning about other cultures, not just our own. If we're going to if we're gonna spread the gospel to all the nations that live around us, we're going to have to do some learning about people from many different nations. And we're going to have to spend time in spaces where we can learn about them, learn about different races and cultures. Than our own. We need a greater awareness. We also need to work on our relationships. And I want to give you a couple of suggestions here um, when it comes to relationships. Uh, first, I want to encourage you to pursue interracial relationships in the body of Christ. Um, awareness is not enough. We, we need to pursue relationships with brethren of different races and cult cultures than ourselves. Um, by the way, one study recently that was done revealed that in a hundred friend scenario, um, black people had eight white friends, two Latino friends, and zero Asian friends. And in a hundred friend scenario, white people had just one black friend, one Latino friend, and one Asian friend. You see, we have a tendency to stay closer to the people that we have more in common with. We have the tendency to want to be around people that we look like or that we talk like or that we act like that we have the most in common with. And, and again, it's not a new issue. In Acts chapter 6, in the earliest church in Jerusalem, the, one of the, the first problem that arose in that church was, was this exact problem where the Greek widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. And notice the Hebrew widows were not being, dis, were not being uh, neglected. There was an issue of discrimination. Now, we don't know whether it was intentional or unintentional, but it was an issue. And I want to suggest that if, if we're going to, uh, to ensure that nobody here gets neglected, we need to pay close attention to Acts 6 and learn from that story how to deal with issues when discrimination or when neglect comes up in, in, in the body of Christ. We need to work to ensure that there's no neglected minority group in our congregation. Many minority brothers and sisters talk to me about feeling lonely in, uh, in their churches that they're a part of. So we need to be careful about that. It could be very easy for us to, uh, to gather with just the people that share, we share more in common with. And then there could be these little cliques in the church and we got these little divides in the church and that will not help in any way that will only divide the body of Christ. Uh, let me add to that, we need to pursue empathy. We need to pursue empathy. Uh, empathy is, I had to look this up because I don't use this word all the time. So uh, empathy is the ability to understand and to share the feelings of another. It's not just sympathy or feeling pity for somebody. Uh, empathy is an attempt to bridge the gap and to share the feelings of another. Romans 12 verse 15, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Galatians 6 and verse 2, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 26, if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. 
Hebrews 13 and verse 3 says to remember those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were also suffering. Now, once you think about this, many brethren, many brethren feel like they can't even talk about race with people who are different than them. Brethren desperately want to be able to talk about race and racism with their brothers and sisters of a different race and culture. And I'll suggest that avoiding the subject doesn't help. I was talking to a sister yesterday, a sister of color, and she was telling me um, that when all these events went down a few months ago and this came back to the forefront of our nation's conscience, that she called some of her white friends and she said, we got to have a talk. She said, we're not texting about this. I want, I want you to hear me on the phone. I want you to hear me crying. I want you to be able to see on FaceTime my tears. I want you to be able to experience what I'm experiencing right now. She said, because if I can't share with you my deepest sorrows, if I can't share with you part of my own identity with some of my closest friends, then are we even really friends? And think about that, in the church of God, it should never be that people feel like they can't share their sorrows, they can't share their burdens, they can't share their heartaches and their pains. It should never be that way in the church of God. If we love our brethren, then we'll listen to each other. We'll seek to understand each other. We'll seek to understand each other so that we can love each other in a way that is helpful and encouraging and builds each other up more truly. Part of empathy, by the way, is not dismissing the experiences of others when brethren share those experiences of racism. Don't respond, well, I haven't seen it, you know. I've never seen it in this church. Uh, don't act like it was just an isolated incident. Well, that, that, that may happen to you, but it doesn't happen to most people. Um, just because I haven't seen it or experienced something doesn't mean that others haven't experienced it. And just because I have a friend of a certain color who agrees with me doesn't make me right. People have different experiences in life. And we, rather than be dismissive about those things, what we ought to do is to say, we should ask ourselves then, how can I through love serve my brethren? How can I through love help my brother? Dismissiveness will destroy relationships, but love will build them up. And finally, on this uh, point of relationships, we need to pursue peace with our brethren. In Titus chapter three and verse two, Paul says, remind them to slander no one to be peaceable and considerate and always gentle toward everyone. This is a command of God. Avoid things that stir up division. Avoid saying things that are going to be insensitive or inconsiderate. Uh, think about what you say, not just in the presence of brethren, but also on social media, in public spaces, and also in private. Word could get around of the things that you're saying. Be careful about this. I'll say this especially because this is going to be a, few a tense few months politically in our nation. We live in this nation, but we are not of this nation. We are of the nation of God, and we need to act like it. Don't cause your brother or sister to stumble by something you say or something you do or something you post on social media. Be peaceable. Be gentle. Be considerate. Pursue peace. All right, well, finally, let's talk for a moment about commitment. What are some things we can commit to do? First, we need to commit to learn from brethren who are different from me. Avoid living in a completely homogenous learning community. You could say, well, I'm a part of this church. Of course, I'm learning from people different than me. And that's true. But sometimes we still try to, find, we try to learn primarily from people who are like us. Don't be so naive as to think that you will learn best only from people of the same race or culture as you. Every culture has blind spots. Every culture has corruption in it. And because of that, every culture has weaknesses. And this is why we need each other. God created the body in such a way that the more diverse our fellowship, the clearer our picture of God. And so we need to commit to learn from one another, not just the ones who are like us, but those who are different than us. Secondly, we need to commit to speak up about racism and racial injustices and speak out against it when we see it. Proverbs 31 verses 8 and 9 says, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and needy. Cyrus is always saying to me, uh, quoting Spider-Man, who says, with great power comes great responsibility. And we know where he got that. He got it from Jesus, to whom much is given, much is required. One sister said uh, about this, she said, silence from our white churches speaks volumes. 
So many are afraid to say the wrong thing, so nothing is said at all. But while missteps will be made, we all understand a heart that is seeking God and the truth. It's worth, it's worth pushing through the discomfort to get us to become the church God wants us to be. And I've heard that from almost every brother or sister I talk to. We would much rather us make mistakes in trying to be part, uh, in trying to be an encouragement than to not say anything at all. Listen to this, brother. This doesn't apply to everyone here, but I, I still want to share it with you as I think it's helpful. Um, one brother of color said to me, he said, personally, the most difficult thing for me is the silence on the issue. It's almost like there's a gentleman's agreement to not talk about racism. And the brethren who are racist and find it difficult to associate with me because of my skin color don't really bother me. But because the issues aren't spoken of nearly enough, naturally, there are going to be individuals that struggle with it on top of those who are just unruly and rebellious to the word of God. But the members who know it's an issue but won't openly rebuke it or speak up about it and those who tolerate it in their circles are very troubling. Typically, these people know the principles and are by every other metric extremely godly and God-focused individuals. But for whatever reason, they choose not to say anything. And these reasons range from loss of friends, loss of influence, apathy toward the subject, and probably more. Unfortunately, even within the church, there's a lot to lose by being vocal on that topic. Because of the weight of the potential repercussions, people who should be strong enough to speak up cower and at best they say something to a person of color letting them know that they care about them and feel bad for them. Reaching out is a good thing, but when the sin is present and evident, the Christian has duties that go beyond comforting the victim. And the silence on the topic can make you feel lonely, like it's just you against the world and your brethren are part of the world. In that scenario, that type of isolation, even while a member of a large congregation is not good and it isn't conducive to a healthy Christian life, even worse, if there are many people of color who are also victims of silence, you could end up with a us versus them. Both end results are opposed to how Christ would have his body to operate. Amen to everything he said there. We need to speak up because we are given by God the opportunity to defend one another and to love one another and to help one another. So let me just end with this. I think it's important for every one of you to know, whether you're black, white, Hispanic, Asian, um, every person here, I want you to know that you are precious and you are beautiful to God. And you are precious and you are beautiful to us. You are deeply loved by God and you are deeply loved by us. We are better and we are stronger because of the diversity that God has blessed us with in this church. And diversity will bring many, many challenges in this church as we continue to work and worship together. But the blessings far outweigh the challenges. And as we continue to try to do what is right, and as we continue to try to care for one another, let us remember the words of our Lord, to love our neighbor as ourself. Not just the neighbors that look like me, or walk like me, or talk like me, but all of our neighbors. In so doing, we will be part of the solution. We will show the world the more excellent way May God help us to continue to learn from him, to continue to live that more excellent way so that we can root out racism and become the united nation that God has dreamed that we would be. Let us pray. Thank you, God, so much for our time together. Thank you for your words. May they sink deep into our hearts. May they help us to root all pride and all sin and all evil, racism, classism, every other egoism in our hearts, Lord. May it, may it be rooted out. May your church stand as a witness for your goodness and your glory in this world. And may we be part of that solution, bringing honor and glory to your name. I pray for each brother and sister here. May they be encouraged. May they be strengthened. May they be comforted through these challenging days. May you build us up together so that with one voice, we may glorify you together and give you the praise you deserve. It's through Jesus we pray. Amen. Thank you guys so much for being with us. Real quickly, I'll just mention that uh, you should see having the worship guide, a number of uh, studies that are going on this week. I will point out there are three of the classes this week that are canceled, uh, Monday at 7 o'clock, Thursday at 7 o'clock, and Saturday. Those, can those classes are canceled this week. So hopefully we can all use that time to encourage one another and, uh, and build each other up. 
There are other classes, though, that are ongoing, including tonight at 5 p.m. We'll have our last study together on magnifying God with our money. Thanks so much for being here. And thanks to everybody for joining us via live stream. May the Lord bless you and keep you all um, and give you peace.